Hey, I'm George from DinosaurGeorge.com. Let's dive right into it. Matthew from Austin, Texas, right down the road from me, says, My four-year-old son, Matthew, loves dinosaurs. Glad to hear that. Uh, he has a question for Dinosaur George. Why are no meat-eating dinosaurs four-legged? It seems that most four-legged dinosaurs are herbivores. Thanks. Well, he's right. You know, predatory dinosaurs all seem to prefer walking bipedally, that is, on two legs. There's some speculation that a couple of them may have been capable of walking on all fours, but most of those were the earlier predators, like um, those in the Triassic and Jurassic. Some of them may have been capable. Um, I've seen a suggestion that dinosaurs like um, uh, Ceratosaurus may have been capable of walking on all fours, but all of the evidence just suggests that these dinosaurs were two-legged. I don't know why. Uh, can't tell you the answer to that. Um, my best guess is being on two legs gives you one advantage, and that is a very fast, short burst of speed. On two legs, you can move that body a little bit quicker. Now, for long distance, it's not very effective after a while, but uh, maybe all they needed was just a jump on their prey, and those two legs gave them the ability to take off very quickly. That's my best guess. All right, Luke from Mournville, Alberta, Canada. Hi, DG. How are you? Luke, I'm doing great. Good to hear from you. Uh, he says, why was Majungatholus changed to Majungasaurus? Uh, well, Luke, the reason why is because um, the first dinosaur that was ever found uh, in Madagascar, well, let me go back. Not the first dinosaur ever found, but they found the remains of a dinosaur in Madagascar, and they named that dinosaur Majungasaurus. Later on, a different group of people found another dinosaur. Now, they thought they found a new kind of dinosaur, so they named theirs Majungatholus. What it turns out is the dinosaur, the second one found, actually was just like the first one found, so they realized that they uh, should have never given it a new name. And so when scientists find these errors, they go back and make the changes. That's sort of the same thing that happened with the dinosaur that people my age called Brontosaurus and you guys call Apatosaurus. It's the same thing. Um, two different dinosaurs, or two dinosaurs that ended up being the same species that were given two different names, that error is corrected and therefore the name has been changed. All right, Keenan from Calgary, Canada. Two of you guys from Canada, cool. Uh, he says, uh, DG, I know dinosaurs didn't live in water and they didn't fly in the air, but did some live underground? P.S. I hope you're having a good day. Keenan, thank you very much. That's very kind of you. I am having a good day and I hope you are too. Um, okay, with the discovery of feathered dinosaurs, now we're starting to realize some dinosaurs could fly, but to your point, they didn't live their life in the air like pterosaurs. They didn't spend all of their time in the air. So um, did they live underground? You know, I remember reading about a dinosaur named Timimus. that if, I, if memory serves me correctly, they believe this may have been a hibernating dinosaur. And so chances are that's about as close to being an underground dwelling dinosaur as that, that I'm aware of. It doesn't mean they didn't exist. Certainly the possibility exists that there were uh, ground-dwelling dinosaurs, perhaps like animals that prefer to live in caves. There may have been dinosaurs uh, that lived in caves. Living underground like mammals, though, probably not so much because their bodies weren't really designed for that. If you look at the basic design of all, pre of all dinosaurs, they don't really have that burrowing body design, the little short, fat, stubby little design with very powerful front legs that would have allowed them to dig through the ground. Um, so I don't think they lived their entire life there, but certainly it, it appears that some dinosaurs may have been capable of either hibernating or at least burrowing maybe for protection, uh, maybe seasonally. We just don't know. But that's a good question, Keegan. Our Keenan. All right, Alex from Manchester, England. Hey, DG, have you heard of the undescribed remains of a Utah raptor at Brigham Young University that states that it may have reached lengths of 36 feet long? Could this be another species of Utah raptor? And what do you think of these estimates? Thanks. Well, Alex, always good to hear from you, my friend. I hope things over in England are going well. You know, I am completely unaware of this. I've heard nothing about this, Alex. If they suggest that a Utah raptor reached 36 feet, Man, to me, that seems awfully big for any kind of a raptor. I don't think any raptor got to that proportion, but I only base that off of what I know of raptors. Um, seems to me like being a raptor meant 
being moderate to small size made you more effective. If you became gigantic, then you lose all of the uh, advantages being a raptor gives you. In other words, you lo lose the speed, you lose the agility, you lose all of the things that makes a raptor so dangerous. So for a raptor to grow to that size, man, I don't know. Uh, if Utah raptor, raptor did get that big, man, that would be a terrifying looking animal, but I don't think it would be any more successful than a uh, raptor of say 10 or 12 or maybe 13 feet long. But I've not heard anything about that, Alex. That's interesting and I hope I get a chance to hear more about it. If anybody out there has any more information about this, um, email me uh, at, uh, at askdinosaurgeorge.com. Go to dinosaurgeorge.com and email me at the Ask Dinosaur George page and um, uh, let me know about it. That's kind of interesting. All right, finally, Keegan from Cincinnati, Ohio. Hey, Dinosaur George, hope you're doing well. I am Keegan. Good to hear from you, buddy. Um, you have talked about how you believe Carcharodontosaurus was stronger and more dominant than Spinosaurus. However, I've heard many other paleontologists agree that Spinosaurus was the apex predator and was easily dominant over Carcharodontosaurus. So his question is, who is correct? Great question, Keegan. One of the essence of science and paleontology especially is that different points of view are very important because it gives us different viewpoints of different people. When you're trying to determine who is the strongest, the fastest, the most dangerous, who would win in a fight between X and Y, that mostly is based on speculation and based on opinion. And so nobody is right or wrong in this debate because there's no way to definitively prove one side or the other. I base my opinion solely and absolutely solely on the design of the skulls of these two dinosaurs. When you look at Spinosaurus, he's got that elongated snout. The problem with an extremely long snout is that the musculatures that slam those jaws shut if your snout is very long, the muscles are only going to come to a certain part along there. And that means the end of your snout doesn't have that same bite force because the muscles are located way back in the back. So in other words, I can close my hand much stronger than I can close my fingers because to close my hands uses the muscles that are closest to it. But to close my fingers are using muscles way back here. I can't pinch very hard with the end of my fingers. I don't have any force. In my hand, I certainly have force. So that's what I mean by explaining why I think the bite force was different. And it is bite force that inflicts the injuries on whoever it is you're fighting. When you look at Carcharodontosaurus, he's got that compact skull that means that the musculature applies bite force almost equally from the front of his nose to the back of his jaw. And that means that if Spinosaurus grabs you, yes, it's going to hurt like crazy, but if he grabs you with the front of his snout, all he's going to do is inflict a nasty wound. Whereas Carcharodontosaurus, in my opinion, when he bites you, he's going to slice through you bone and all and rip out an enormous chunk of you. And therefore, if these two animals met, I think Carcharodontosaurus has an advantage to be able to inflict much greater injuries, much bigger wounds, and therefore would become victorious if in fact he got into a fight. Now keep in mind again that this is all based on just simply opinion. When you are looking at things like behavior and fighting capabilities and all those things, simply and absolutely a guess. And so some paleontologists may agree with me, some may, may disagree. So we're not necessarily right and wrong. We just have differing points of view. All right, that's it for this one. If you guys have a question, go to my website, dinosaurgeorge.com. Click on the Ask Dinosaur George page and fill out the form and submit it. Uh, while you're there, uh, follow me on uh, Facebook and follow me on Twitter. I send out some pretty cool information and I'd love to hear from you. All right, I'll see you guys soon for you young people out there. You know my saying, please practice your reading because reading skills are very important. And for everybody out there, appreciate the good manners. It's so good to hear from you all. Take care and I'll see you soon.